Hello again. Uh, it's me, Philip. And so for my first video, <laughs> uh, welcome back. I don't know if you saw the introduction to my channel. If you're not familiar with what it is that, that we do here, we being the royal plural for just, it's just me. Um, thankfully, my sister is also helping with the editing. And my brother has, has uh, this is actually his old room. So this is a composition of his, of his work. So my entire family is almost here in spirit. <laughs> and my parents made me. <laughs> so, so here we are, gathered together today. And I thought that we could start by going through Genesis together. I want to look at the Hebrew text. Um, I'm not sure if I'll if I'll put the actual text up on screen yet. That might be pretty cool for those of you who can read Hebrew and with a translation, or if you're trying to learn Hebrew. Um, that's kind of the reason I want to do this, is because I really don't, my Hebrew is pretty bad. <laughs> so, so I want to go through the Bible, the whole Bible, in Hebrew and in Greek, and then see how the language is actually interacting with itself and building itself up in terms of, you know, the vocabulary and how it's used and so on. And then one can also see the, uh, what are they called, Semiot semiotic? No, but there's a, there's a word. The, the connections between, you know, what word is being used and what context and how this informs the word and then how this word can be used uh, is kind of further refined and developed throughout its use in the Bible. And then you can see, oh, okay, um, there's a concept that's, that's becoming clearer and clearer because of how these words are being used and that helps describe who um, the God is that is being depicted through these texts, because they are all sort of, can you say, theophanic texts? <laughs> um, I don't know if I can say that, but I'm just going to say that now, and be proven wrong at some point, probably, hopefully, if I am wrong, that would be good. Uh, because God sort of brings himself to bear through these texts, in a way that isn't expected. It is kind of the way in which Luther, Martin Luther now, the the reformer from the, well, he was born in the 15th century and then died in the 16th century. So from that time period, from the Reformation time period, he, um, he describes this kind of the way in which the, the word of God works as sacramental. And you can see this, this very nicely in his, uh, I recently read through the third section, not the whole thing, because I only found a Latin copy, but the third section of his, um, De Conciliis et Ecclesiae, so about the councils and the congregations, uh, in which he sort of goes through the seven marks of the church. And he says, well, one could say these are seven sacraments. And not, they're not the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. They're not like marriage and whatever, but they're the word and the Holy Communion and baptism and the ministry. Uh, and then the discipline that comes with the office of the key. So you can kick people out of the church because um, that's what bodies do if there's waste in the body, the body gets rid of the waste kind of thing. Uh, it, there is a process of judgment, of discrimination that takes place. That's one of the marks of the church. And, and then there's a really important one, and the last one was suffering, and I forgot what the really important one was. But they are there, and you can look it up. It's a great book, uh, or at least the third section. I can't speak for the rest. Uh, he does a, a whole bunch of Pope bashing, but I guess that's justified. Um, Although I did, uh, I did skim through some of that. <laughs> but Genesis 1, verse 1, in Hebrew, I want to read the Hebrew and then look at the English. I, the English translation that, I've, that I did read through it again in recently, Genesis now, was the King James Version of the Bible, because I want to also get a grasp, an understanding of what English in the 16th century was like, end of the 16th century, because uh, I think this was... Uh, was Anyway, but I, it was a long process. English. <laughs> so, history of English a bit. Trying to understand that a bit better. That was the, the version I read of Genesis recently, and it led to some very interesting insights. Um, because of the way it's translated. It, the way a book is translated, obviously, allows you to put certain emphasis on, on specific aspects of the, the ancient language that is being translated. You can't capture it perfectly. You're always putting emphases um, on different aspects of the way in which that language works, and through the through the whole, hopefully you, you still get a good understanding of what is being 
uh, described. And that's really the way I want to go about this. I want to talk about truth because God calls himself truth. He says, I am the truth and the way and the life. And so he is the truth. So truth here won't be an abstract kind of platonic concept that reaches beyond human capacity to imagine or so. It does also, but it's also graspable. He makes himself, he comes to us veiled, so hidden, but in very tangible things. So he's hidden uh, because you don't expect him to come through things like just human language. I mean, for us, human language seems like profound or whatever, but everyone can, a child can speak. So something so mundane as human language, the word, one of these seven signs um, that Luther uses to describe Christ's body here on earth, as he has Christ has sort of instituted it into his creation to be recognizable, the, the word, just through human speech, profound. And then like water, like Christ says, I am in this water, I bind myself to this water, and, and I bind you into my family tree through this water and with bread and wine and Holy Communion. So, so I want to approach things like truth is who he says he is, and, um, and we can only read descriptions of him, we can only describe him, we cannot determine who he is, we can only describe him, uh, confess who he is. And we confess this because he has told us, he has told us who he is, so he tells us, I am that I am, and then we say, yes, you are that you are, that you are. So this is, um, this is how I want to approach it. So Genesis 1, doesn't get too long. This is also the first video, and I'm just dragging it out now. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz pretty straightforward. Here we also have a, a classical Hebrew um, uh, device in the language which is called a merism. That's how we learnt it. Merismus. Um, it sort of takes the two extremes of something to encapsulate the whole. So heaven, the uttermost heights, and <clears throat> earth, the uttermost uh, depths in a way. In a way. So these two dimensions anyway, these two worlds, the world of the heavens and the world of the earth, and it brings them together. Or it sort of it describes all of creation, that's what I'm trying to say, sorry. It describes all of creation in terms of its outermost limits. So God creates the heavens, he creates the unseen realms, he creates the realms in which the heavenly beings exist, um, also that are visible, like you can see the the you can you can even traverse the the outer space and so on deep space you can see the heavenly bodies that he hangs into heaven um, but there's also some kind of another dimensional of uh, dimension to heaven that we don't understand which is uh, where God's throne is and where his angels are and so on and there is also the earth which is more what mankind is bound to is rooted in so the heavens and the earth, God creates everything. Ex nihilo, which is Latin for nothing, out of nothing, from nothing, he creates everything. He's he's there, so in the beginning. And I think one can also understand this bereshit, the reshit in, in reshit, the beginning. Um, one can understand, I think one can read this Christologically even, or in the beginning, as, as the beginning, he is the beginning, and the end, is what he says of himself as well. And this Rashid comes from Rosh, I think. I'm just gonna, I've got it up here on, on Bible Hub, using Strong's Concordance, good old classic. I'm looking at the King James English, after all, and that's where the Strong's Concordance, what, what it sort of was built on, was the King James Version. And then obviously the Hebrew and the Greek. Um, so Bereshit comes from Harosh, the head. That we also still have that in in the the New Year of um, of the of the Orthodox Jews, I think, of Judaism. Um, how is it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the beginning of the the year? Hashanah is here, Hashanah. Uh, so Bereshit in the beginning. Bereshit is is feminine, and what's well, the beginning? Uh, 
in the beginning, but it's, yeah, it comes from Rosh, the head, so the principal part, the first part, the beginning. Uh, and in the beginning, God is the beginning. God, in the beginning, he creates. So Elohim, again, is the, the word. It's a plural word, so there's like a, a pluralistic character to God, but he is always described as one. So he is one God, which we'll come to later on in, in Deuteronomy especially. Um, yeah, so God in the beginning creates everything out of nothing, from heavens to earth and everything that fills them. But first heavens and earth, let's not get carried away yet. Then, verse 2. The Haaretz. Should I read the English? I think I'll read the English first, actually. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. I'm sort of translating, but I've got a. It's I've got both languages here. So, but I'm looking at the Hebrew as well, just to try and to stay accurate to that, so we can get more of the Hebrew kind of nuances. As far as, I mean, I don't know anything, so <laughs> so as far as I can share those. But you will have to correct me, and that'll be great for me as well. I'm, not, I'm trying not to depend too much on secondary literature yet. This will be kind of a run-through of the primary sources. Uh, yeah, so... So the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now for the Hebrew. The Ha'aret, Hayata, Tohu, Vivohu... The Hoshech al Pene te Hom Veruach Elohim Merachefet al Pene Hamaim. As you can tell, my Hebrew is not so good, <laughs> but uh, but I'm that's why I'm doing this. So if you you can fast forward, I guess. <laughs> so so the earth was formless and void. This is actually you come across this term quite often in German. Uh, I'll be like, oh, my room is like totally tohu va va vohu, or I don't know if they say va vohu, but tohu, uh, formless and, and void, bohu, and hoshech, hoshech, it's also interesting, the darkness, these are pretty, they're kind of like frightening uh, adjectives, um, or nouns, sorry, the nouns, darkness and, and void and, and formlessness, all describing kind of chaos, and uh, the, the obviously, to home is also a word that comes up here, to home, and that some people um, connected etymologically to the to the chaos monster, Tiamat. <laughs> so you can see here this imagery um, of of God creates everything out of nothing, and then in this everything that He's created, I know Martin Luther in his commentary to Genesis create uh, calls it an Urzuppe, I think, which is like a an, a primal soup, <laughs> uh, if I remember correctly. But that was a while ago, and. And then in this Wurzopa, you've got basically like, it's described as water, the waters of creation, which is also something big in, I think, Egyptian uh, mythology. But but it's also kind of, for us Christians who, who understand the, the revealed uh, God as one who works through water to recreate and to create and originally, uh, there's a lot of like sort of baptismal imagery that one can, well, that one can recognize here as well, I think. So... So in this, this darkness and this, this chaos and, and this void and this sort of like the, you can see the waters moving, there's no shape to them. They're just constantly sort of shapeless and, and unstable is how Jacob describes his, his son Reuben, the, the firstborn. Um, he, just, he says, you are unstable as water in, at the end of Genesis. So here we've got water in the beginning and the end, which we'll speak about again in terms of Noah's Ark and the drought of Joseph. Ooh. Ooh, uh, spoilers, but um, yeah, so 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 we've got this sort of chaotic void in the beginning, and God's spirit is hovering over it, the spirit of God. So here we've we've got the beginning and the end, God, the Son, for all intents and purposes, God the Father who creates, the Creator, Elohim, Elohim who actually contains kind of like the plural Trinitarian God as one God. And we've got the person of the spirit, um, Haruach, or Veruach, yeah? and Ruach, the spirit, Elohim, the Ruach Elohim, and the spirit of God. Mirachefet uh, was hovering over Pinei Hamaim. Maim is water, so Hamaim. 
I always wonder if there's like a connection between the problem. I'm again showing my ignorance, which is great. <laughs> Please inform me. But uh, but Maim is water and Shamaim is heaven. So you've got the, the waters of primordial creation or whatever, Maim, and the Shamaim of the heavens. Um, and I'm wondering if there's some sort of a connection. Also because the heavens do reflect the waters, um, the, you know, how that works with the atmosphere and light and reflection and stuff. I don't. Um, but if you do, then maybe you can also expand on that in the, in, in the comments. <laughs> I can say that oh, I watch a lot of, unfortunately, I watch a lot of too much YouTube. <laughs> so I'm like feeling very meta at the moment. I'm loving it. So the waters, he's hovering, the spirit is hovering over the face of the waters. And what comes next is great. This is really baptismal to me because it shows that God draws forth out of the water, uh, out of his congregation, essentially, he draws forth something new um, into which he sort of plants his promise also and brings to fruition his promise and the whole story really begins to grow out of this land that he's brought forth out of the water, which is also, you know, what baptism makes of us. Is that in the text? Well, it depends how, how where you sort of put the limits on the text. I guess if it's one complete text, then I can reach into the New Testament, right? But if it's if, it, if there's no continuity here, then please just see it as water. But I think that's how the language works. This is what I sort of want to explore because I haven't gone into it in this detail yet. It's not through the whole Bible. And I want to see how the language then unfolds, interprets itself. Interpret. Hamenoyal. <laughs> yeah, I interpret. So, Vayomer Elohim, Yehi Or, Vayehi Or, which is Hebrew for, and God said, Vayomer Elohim, and he said, who said it? God, Elohim. Vayomer Elohim, Yehi Or, be light. We say, let there be light, you know. Um, it is, yeah, Joseph. So, let there be light. Be there light. <laughs> um, Vayahi or, and there was light. So, this is kind of, uh, yeah, again, the sort of, the God speaks creation into being. In the beginning, God, bara, which is a, a verb also that's only used for God. And I think it's, it comes up again somewhere later in the Old Testament, bara, God created. Um, so God is the only one who bara. Um, uh, is that, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of a Swedish pun here. Actually. <laughs> I was like bara, bara. I'm subscribed to this bara svensk uh, memes on Facebook and there it's like bara, it means only Swedish memes, I think. So it's like bara is only for God. <laughs> uh, yeah, bara good or whatever God is in good. Got, can't, I don't know what it is. See, I don't know things. But anyway, I, f I thought that was funny. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> um, so let there be light and there is light. God speaks light into creation. And this is how John also, so John takes up the first chapter of Genesis in his gospel. And he says, sorry, Genesis is so full of stuff because it's the foundation of everything that follows. <laughs> so, so there's so few words, but there's just so much, so much gravity and so much not gravity. Well, yes, gravity, I guess the foundation has to be as, as to be grave enough to hold up everything else, but it's also just so, so rich, you know? So that was verse three. God speaks the light into his creation and his word goes into creation and it is light. It is illuminating. Um, Yes, sorry, I need to maybe take a phone call from a friend, but then we'll carry on after this. So, the, I think this might be a good place to, to bring it to an end. Sorry, the phone call didn't happen, but, <laughs> but I'm back. And uh, unfortunately for you. Um, 
and we were speaking about how the light of God is spoken into his creation and it's interesting because before the light is spoken into the creation everything is darkness and chaotic and there's no order <laughs> um, but then as soon as the light enters into creation which is what John takes up and John connects it to the logos with which which is like the, div the divine ordering principle um, uh, and makes it again sort of personifies it by the guidance of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit helps us to recognize that this light is Christ and that it is what 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 sort of reveals and discerns and places and organizes and sort of uh, um, structures structures the creation into which it is spoken into which he has spoken we can say because John has shown us that this light is Christ and so all all of creation um, is Christ a form which we also see in Colossians but don't want to jump ahead too much here but that's how Paul describes uh, creation that it is made through him and for him uh, for Christ the word um, so yeah the light spoken into into the earth and then we get something really cool i'll i'll finish off after the light and then we can start with the with with the next couple of days of creation with the next episode um so and god saw that the light was good or he saw the light which was good and he divided between the light and between the darkness. So, and the Hebrews, Vayera Elohim et haor kitov, Vayavdeu Elohim ben haor, the ben or uben, sorry, uven, <laughs> uven hachoshech. Uh, so, Yara, to see, God saw that the light was good. He saw the light. He saw the light, which is interesting also, with with regard to eyes and the light. The eyes are the light of the body, is how Jesus describes it, Matthew 6, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount. So eyes and seeing and light, God saw the light. It's also the first thing that God sees, so to, so to speak. Um, but it's kind of like he also recognizes the light, the Logos, his son, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And again, the whole baptismal thing, because that, that it's as if the whole creation plays out again in the scene in which Christ is baptized then in the Gospels, uh, where also the Spirit hovers above the waters like a dove. <laughs> so, whoa, it's as if it's like all one story. But anyway, brilliant setup. Um, God be praised for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, and God saw that the light, or he saw the light, I keep getting it wrong, but he saw the light, which was good. The light is good. And this is interesting because there's no comment on the darkness. So, Choshech, which I mentioned before, which is also taken up in like Psalm 23, if I remember correctly again. Um, the, the Valley of the Shadow of Death, I don't know if it's like Tordus Shadow. I don't know if that is... Um, uh, or um, or something, Maavet, depending on how you pronounce it. I want to prefer, uh, prefer the softer, um, uh, is it a tav? The softer tav? Um, that's my preference because I like the th sound. Must be my Germanic ear. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> For those of you who don't like it, but I I prefer that, so I'll be using that. Um, yeah, so God doesn't comment on the darkness. He says, the light, I see you, you are good. Um, also, maybe it has something to do with like revelation and judgment being a, a light, as, as is described in John 3, 19, where it says, this is the krima, the, the judgment. No, this is the krisis, sorry, the, ju the judgment, the crisis. <laughs> um, and that the light came into the darkness and, and humanity loved the darkness which it's exactly the same language that's being used here. Actually, this is giving me goosebumps. I didn't realize this, but it's great. Um, Bible is a good book. And uh, so, 
So in the light, things are laid bare. God sees them and one has discernment and the light sort of reveals and that is declared good by God. Um, so what is hidden away in darkness is ambiguous and can lead to destruction and it often does as we see in, excuse me, in the unfolding of history according to the Bible. Yes, so God divides between the two. He says, ah, the light is good. So I will divide between the light and the darkness. So we've got light and darkness. And already there's kind of a, the darkness is described very ambiguously. Very like, what's, well, I'm not going to call it good, but, uh, but I'm not going to say anything else about it either. It's there. I created it. He created it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's where, well, now we can finish off with the, with the first day, right? And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And on the Hebrew, let's see if I can get it together. Vayikra Elohim laor yom. Velachoshech kara laila. Vayahi uh, erev, vayahi boker, boker, yom echad. So, and God called to the light. He called to the light. It's kind of like God calls out to the thing with its name. And there we go. So, again, here I don't want to say Christ is a creation. He is part of the Trinity from the beginning. He is Bereshit. But, but, um, but he is also the one who becomes um, creational and accessible to us creations. So he becomes a creation despite the fact that he is at the same time the creator. So a bit of a simul going on there. Simul justus et peccatus, simul creator et creationem. I don't know what the nominative is of creat, creatio. No, is it? I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Um, so, yeah, so God God speaks almost himself into creation. He speaks himself into creation. Ooh, and where he finds himself in creation then, where he has spoken himself into it, he's like, that's good. I'll just separate that from... <laughs> which is kind of how he treats his children through the scriptures as well. So we might be onto something there, but uh, yeah, he separates that from the darkness, which is ambiguous and potentially destructive and, and unstable as Reuben. And, uh, and he calls it day, you are day. Yeah. Uh, um, and in the darkness, la choshech, to that he says, you are evening, he says evening. And then, that's its name, Erev. So, Vayahi Boker, Voker, morning. Vayahi uh, Erev. No, sorry, he calls it Laila. He calls it night. I'm wrong. But he calls it night. And then it's e evening, Erev, which has. Uh, this was so interesting. I can't remember. I think. I don't know if that was in a the theological uh, dictionary. But Erev also has connotations of. of uh, uh, conjunction <laughs> uh, of marriage of, of sort of the marital um, well sexual intercourse but I'm trying to figure out this sort of like yeah you know, of, the, of the sort of intercourse then of, of the light melding with with um, with the horizon um, and leading to darkness or something it has that kind of a that kind of a, a connotation apparently as well which I found interesting because in English we call evening Eve, and that is the woman. And there's also kind of obviously from the from in the Bible there's a kind of a sexual um, uh, connotation to Eve as well, to the woman. Um, so because yeah, which we'll get we'll get into that when the when the terms male and female come up, Zahar and I've, I've forgotten the female one, but uh, when these terms come up, then we can look at it again. I think it comes from Bakar. But I'm not sure to dig, to pierce, to penetrate. So there's already a bit of this whoa, ancient worldview, man, cosmology. But it's it's 
I think it's got its accuracy, if one understands it correctly. Um, yes. <laughs> so, the first day. Yeah, so the evening, Laila. There's also Lilith, this mythological figure, also from sort of the Hebraic mythology, mythology that established, that sort of comes out of this uh, story, I think. So Laila is related to Lilith, or Layla is also a name that we have nowadays, and it's it's yeah it's related to this kind of demon of the night, who's like a, a temptress demon, who who is also sort of yeah that's another way in which one can see this as being kind of sexually loaded. Uh, yeah, so Erev, and then Boker is where the light re-emerges, and 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 so on. Is it Psalm 8? Or I can't remember which it is, but the bridegroom arising from his tent, the, the dawn, the light, sort of uh, breaking over the land, the world again, and bringing back order and and so on. Uh, which also one sees in the, the, the Garden of Eden, sort of with Adam and Eve, and, and the, the way they interact with one another, that the woman leads to uh, the fall, in a way, and then the new Adam leads to the reestablishment of, of order which I don't want to put down the woman because she has a place as well in creation, but this is how the, the story goes. And if one looks at it in, to, in even just a literary sense, it's quite fascinating to see these patterns um, here. So that's the first day, Yom Echad. Um, and I think that's where we can stop for now. It's, this, is a long, this is a long video, but I think it's great. I think we can take our time. This is, after all, the Word of God, and if you're just listening to it, um, then hopefully it has put you into a kind of a trance that makes whatever it is that you're doing while you're listening to this a bit easier. Uh, yeah, then thanks for joining again, and uh, the, this beginning of the adventure through through the Sea of Scriptures, as, as one of the Church Fathers described it. Who was it? Was it? But he said the uh, scriptures are like a, sorry, Michael, <laughs> like an ocean, and we we ride on it like like on a boat. Um, I just want to ascribe everything to Irenaeus at the moment, but I don't think it was him. Anyway, so so the adventure shall continue next time uh, on my channel. I'm still looking for a name for it. I don't know if it'll be currently because I haven't just made it yet while I'm recording this, if you're interested in that sort of thing. I'm still looking for a name. I, <laughs> I have a file called Full Tube, but that's not so great. I was thinking more of like um, uh, the... something like the hypocrite or something. Something with hypocrite in it because it's that's that for me has been a recurring recognition. It's like, oh man, no matter what you say, you're always actually guilty. <laughs> you're always guilty of the exact same thing that you're accusing. Um, it's obviously only Christ that isn't the hypocrite, and this is kind of where we say, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, we sort of have to, well, we don't have to do anything. It's, it's that he gives us the ability to trust him despite the fact that we're so clearly incapable of trusting him. <laughs> Does that sound contradictory? Anyway. Or does it sound like the brilliance of God? Um, either way, as you can hear, I'm getting hoarse. Uh, I did a sermon today as well, so I've been speaking way too much. Um, but it's good, and I'm grateful. I'm very grateful for everything, and especially also for your attendance. We'll see each other in the next episode, and begin with Genesis 1 verse 6. So until then, have a great day. Great time until then. <laughs> Bye.